Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we have a very special guest. We've got Kieran on from Alluvium co-founder. Now, he's been doing the rounds, getting around to a lot of people doing uh, interviews. So if you're one of those people hopping around interviews, I will leave timestamps so you can jump around and check out topics in case you've heard some of this stuff before. But firstly, for everyone who hasn't seen it, my background is in mobile gaming, general mobile gaming, none of the crypto stuff. So the crypto is a bit new to me. Um, so for my audience, Kieran, firstly, welcome. Uh, just tell us a bit about yourself and about Alluvium in general, what it is and all that sort of stuff. For sure. Thanks for having me on, Kevin. Uh, and congrats on starting the new channel. I think <laughs> it's going to do quite well for you. Hoping. We need more, we need more Aussie streamers out there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I started in crypto back in 2016. And I, so our, uh, Aaron and I, who's my fellow co-founder, He's actually my brother and our other brother, there's, there's actually four of us, but uh, the other one is in crypto and you've probably heard of his project. It's called Synthetics. And, uh, and so I started back five years ago, a over-the-counter cryptocurrency exchange. It was actually the first in Australia. And we started working with a bunch of Bitcoin companies that were literally just starting up. and it was basically a way for people to, you, you would know your, yourself, uh, the, the places that we went into were news agents. Yep. And so you would essentially bring in a hundred bucks and back in, in those days, you'd get like one tenth of a Bitcoin for a for hundred bucks. But uh, you would, you'd hand over your cash and they would give you Bitcoins. And, and we basically built this platform that, that allowed the digital transaction to, to occur. And that gave me a bunch of exposure to Bitcoin and I'm a bit of a degen, so I just ended up gravitating more towards what were very speculative tokens back then in like Ethereum. And, uh, and so I, I dabbled a little bit. I invested for, for maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, it didn't actually work out too well for me. But, uh, and, and so I ended up leaving and, and going and founding another business. And then it was, it was about early last year that Cain kept on pestering me saying like, dude, crypto's back, like it's, it's exploding. This is whole DeFi summer. I was watching his project and that was the biggest catalyst for me. We're super, super competitive. And he was like, man, I'm like, my protocol's over a billion dollars. And I was like, okay, well, fuck this. I'm, I'm back in. Let's, let's do it. So I started, I, I took a whole bunch of capital and, and I started investing. It's getting a feel for, for the market again and, and the different projects that were out there. And I stumbled upon Axie Infinity, which is the, the game that most people have, have heard of in crypto. It's really, really blowing up at the moment. And that was my sort of aha moment where I went, okay, I like this. Like, I, I like this whole concept, but the game is just too basic for me. And so I thought, what would happen if we could build a game that was the same quality as your, your typical mainstream games that, that you would be used to playing and add in the, the crypto elements from the start, the, the play to earn mechanics, the governance, and uh and and having it you know fully decentralized and essentially steered and and owned by the players and so um so yeah so i ended up going to our, our other brother aaron and and i said look this is the opportunity he was actually thinking about doing his his own game and not in crypto more more in mainstream and so i got him right at the right time and we both looked at it and it took about a week and we're like, okay, let's, let's go all in on it. And so, yeah, that's, that's when we started Alluvium. And, and Alluvium, just a general wrap up on the, the general gist of the, what the game is as well. Yeah. So it's essentially, I'm a massive Pokemon fan. And so for me, I was watching all these collections, the crypto punks, crypto kitties, and I knew that we had to have something that people were collecting. And so I wanted Pokemon and Aaron, and, and to be fair, but both Aaron and I both like the, the game Team Fight Tactics, which is uh, basically an expansion that League of Legends brought out. 
And it's a, it's an auto battler genre of, of game and it's super, super uh, strategic and very, very addicting. And, uh, and Aaron had been playing that game for like six or seven years. And so we just couldn't agree on which game to, to build. So we decided let's just do a, a combination of both. And so we mashed them together and, and yeah, basically you've got this open world RPG where you're walking around and, and you're, you're, you're battling and collecting these alluvials. There's a bunch of arenas that you can go into to, to play like PVP modes against other people. And, uh, and yeah, what, what we're trying to do is just build a really, really immersive overworld that, that has graphics that you, you might not have even seen in mainstream games, let alone crypto. That's, that's basically what we want to deliver. Yeah, definitely. I definitely from a mobile gaming standpoint, from what I'm used to, like it's definitely beyond that. And you guys do have plans to make a mobile client next year as well for it as well, which is probably yeah, a absolutely. big market to land. And with that, is that going to be like the whole game on mobile or just like a, a portion like you can PVP on mobile? I think it'll be a step by step process. And yeah. the thing that makes the most amount of sense is to allow people to battle first. Yeah. The the overworld is obviously going to take a, a lot more, not just like processing power and, and stuff from, from the GPU and stuff, but it's, it's just a lot harder to use the, those low poly. Like we've, everything is very, very high fidelity, high poly assets, yeah. especially in our environment. And so it's, it's much easier to just take a, a small subset of your environment, which is the battle arena, and then simply just have the, the battle mechanics on, on mobile first. Yep. And then, you know, we'll slowly look to, to roll out the entire game. Yeah, definitely. On, uh, I mean, on mobile. and the speed at which you're rolling out this game is ridiculous. Like you'll have the game probably launched within a year of starting it. Is yeah. That, is that about yeah, right? so, yeah. Yeah. So we, people are pretty surprised when we say this. And I, I honestly, I don't know why, but we've got over 100 people in our DAO now and in order to build a triple a game you need minimum 200 to, to 300 people like as a minimum and so you know we we went and raised like 50 million dollars us and so that's why i'm a little bit confused when people are like oh whoa we have got like uh, like i know that no other crypto project or not many other crypto projects have that size of team but for me, it's like, what were we going to spend the $50 million on? Like, just yeah. flowers and lollipops over <laughs> here? Or, or are we building a game? Yeah, like, just, what are we just doing? Just in the back pocket, mate. Just, just chugging. Yeah, but, <laughs> well, some people said that. They're like, I don't know. We thought you were going to rug pull. And it's yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and with that, that's actually a good timing. Can you talk me, like, because this is what blew my mind about it when I looked into it. Because, like, the, where the profits go and the whole governance system on top of that as well. Um, do you want to just touch on mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so this was probably one of the, the biggest hurdles for me to get over. But at the same time, when I really, uh, when I really looked into it and, and started analyzing this, this new type of uh, governance where essentially you as the, the founder or, or the co-founder or whatever don't have the power. The power goes back to the players and not just the governance model, which, which I'll, I'll go into, but as you're saying, we've built this, the, the tokenomics and, and the way that the revenue mechanics work, uh, all of the different functions in, in the game where you spend money on, whether it be traveling to new regions, curing shards, uh, your, your exchange fees, enhancements, all of, all of these different little things that, uh, that people are putting money into go into a vault. And then that vault will, every now and again, it will buy ILV off the market, which creates this enormous buy pressure for, uh, and, and it's literally in, in the liquid markets of either sushi or, or whatever. And so you, you'll see this, this pump in, in ILV when we do those massive buys. And then we actually distribute 100% of those revenues back to the people who are staked in the protocol and so 
it's never been done before. It's and and it's scary as fuck, right? Because you're sitting there and you're like, oh my god, like I'm building this game. We've got all, we've got all these <laughs> core contributors. You know, we're talking about going to 200, 300 people, and we're just giving all the money away. But it's the reason that we're so big already. You know, we, we you look at our market cap and people are like, what the hell is going on there? And it's because this is going to revolutionize gaming. Like to to literally tell someone, like when I tell my friends who are lame as they're not, they're not in crypto, and you say, you know. We're giving 100% of, of profits of, of going back to people who are stake. They're like, what how, But how does that even work? That was exactly and, my reaction. <laughs> like, I was like, what? Like, who would do that? Who's crap? And actually, it's funny. We, uh, we had one of the GMs of Riot reach out to us recently, and we had a really long conversation, and he was just fascinated by the whole model and, and whatever. And we said to him, we're like, hey, uh, how, how far away do you think you are from from entering crypto, you know, we've, we've got this whole model over here where you could probably go back to your bosses and, and pitch it. It's amazing. It's instead of all of the, the money that, that uh, TFT generates from skins and it goes back to Riot's central uh, entity, let's give that back to all the players. Are you with me? And he's like, get the fuck away from me. Like, no, no, like that's never going to happen in a million years. And it's, you know, because it's a little bit outlandish, it's a crazy idea, but it allows you to, like, how much the psychology of the people that are playing that game versus I'm sinking in all of these costs that I'm never going to get back. I'm like, well, I'm free to, to spend as much money as I want in this because I'm probably going to double that or triple that or in crazy circumstances like actually 50 times what I put in and so it makes people content on spending shitloads of money. And so, you know, what you give away that you would normally take as a centralized entity is nothing compared to the, the additional revenues that, that you should be making because of that reason. Yeah, definitely. For me, for me the big comparison I made was, um, so like I've been doing full-time content creation for mobile games, but I barely spend money in mobile games because some logic in me goes, why would I spend money that actually gets me nothing? Whereas before I got big into mobile games, I was a big, <laughs> I was a big Yu-Gi-Oh competitor in competitive, <laughs> in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, but like. I didn't mind buying. <laughs> I didn't mind buying packs of cards and stuff because you actually had something that you could mm. then sell on as well. So like when I saw this, like over about two weeks after talking to my mate Seaton, absolute legend, I'll leave a link to his channel. But mm -hmm. I, I just went like like I have no issue putting thousands of dollars into staking. Um, which in case some of my other audience don't understand what that is, it's basically like you lock that money away. Um, you buy the cryptocurrency, you lock it away and they give you returns on your investment, but the returns are like 600 to 700%. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, I, I put a few thousand dollars in and in the four months and or ish until the game launches, um, if you have $10,000 locked away, you'll sort of end up having like $4,000, um, no, 4X. So you probably have $40,000 to spend in the game. So on a smaller scale, people put in, you know, a hundred bucks, you got 400 bucks by the time the game comes around from the, the, just the interest that you get from it. Now, obviously that's dependent on the token and stuff like that. So it could go up, it could go down, but just the whole model behind that was what I found really interesting. And like I said, it goes away from that paying to have something that really in, in other games, the, the devs own because in the terms of service, they mm -hmm. can do whatever they want with it. They can take it away. They can, whereas this is an actual asset that you hold, you can put it in your crypto wallet and your hardware wallet and it sits in your pocket type thing. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the big difference that, that blew me away as someone who's not, was not like huge into crypto originally. Um, and that's the big difference, but obviously and this is, you go, so, sorry, you go. Oh, no, I was just going to say to tie into that, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about free-to-play um, side of things as well. But you, what were you going to say? But this is, this is the thing, right? Like uh, this, uh, when you look at it and you think, okay, what's going to be the thing that, that breaks down these walls of, of the 
taboo nature of crypto, right? Like how, like everyone's like, oh, it's a scam or they, you know, they're buying firearms or it's pornography or all this shit, right? Until, and, and you look at what they have right now. Like I think DeFi broke down a lot of those barriers, right? Yeah. Decentralized finance essentially is the same thing as you walking into a bank and saying, hey, I would like to deposit my $100,000, please, sir. And the guy goes, okay, no worries. We'll give you your 1.6% interest per annum. In DeFi, there, you know, the, the, there's obviously, you can go into super degen stuff and get, you know, 100% plus. But if you go into the, the very, very secure protocols that have been around for, for a long, long time, they're offering you 10, 15, 20 times more of a return on your savings than what your traditional banks are offering you. And so when people, but again, it's super opaque. Like it's, 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 it's hard to get into. There's so many intricate details of, of these protocols. You've got to read a white paper that's like 70 pages long. You're sitting there throwing terms at you that are like super, you know, crypto native. And you're just like, oh, it's too hard. I'm going back to the bank. Whereas gaming, it's like, you know how to game, right? Like, and the crypto side of it, you, you've gotten into staking. So congrats on, on doing that. But even if you hadn't, you still are like, well, I like this game. I like the look of it. The gameplay looks cool. And as you're saying, it's free to play. We've broken down that, that barrier, which other crypto games uh, still have up. And so for us, we are literally trying to be the... The protocol or, or one of you know many protocols that literally onboards millions of people into crypto and then once you're here and now you've started staking in a gaming protocol you're probably likely to start going hmm okay what other things are around and then all of a sudden you're you've adopted crypto it makes more sense to you you're in a few discords and everyone is in a better place in, in crypto from this new gaming movement. It's it's just going to be huge. Definitely. And I, and I think the thing, and this was me personally, for about three years, I've been like, I really got to learn crypto, like get into the crypto space because like I know I should, but I just didn't have that deep interest in the general finance of it and stuff. And then mm -hmm. once I saw NFTs firstly at the start of the year and then transitioned into games, that was mm -hmm. like, and, and I find gamers, it's kind of like when, like when people first realize you can download APKs on your Android phone, it's like, Ooh, that's scary. But then you, you're going to do it anyway, because you want to play the game. And I feel like that's like gamers have that push to do something different to figure it out because you want to play mm -hmm. that game. And I think that's definitely what I, like my, my thought is that like, yeah, the gaming will definitely sort of bring crypto more mainstream. Um, and sort of start that adoption process of it. But even the gaming will take time to get mass adoption, but oh, yeah, yeah. I can definitely see it being that first like introduction to the, the general public of the actual practicality of it. But um, yes. Yeah. But yeah, agree. on that free to play side of the game. Um, so like something like Axie, for instance, which I played for two weeks, got my payout and sold everything up because even though everyone's like, but Axie's, you know, it's going to do well. I, I just want a game. So I just put it all into Alluvium to stake to get my returns for when the game launches. But the, mm -hmm. the, the problem with like that sort of thing is you've got a barrier to entry in that game of, I think the floor to buy one Axie at the moment, it's actually dropped. I think it's around $250. So it's $750 mm -hmm. to build a team to start playing, which won't actually genu generate you that much because it sucks. Um, they do have scholarships and stuff like that, obviously. But with this, you've got a free-to-play entry, but if you want to get to the peak, you're probably going to have to spend some money, but at least you can experience the game and figure out if it's something you want to put a bit of cash into first. So just there's one quick... I'll let you just summarize what you can do as a free-to-play, and then I've got some mm -hmm. things I've been thinking about that I want to ask you about the, the topic of it. So jump in. No worries. So the free to play is, is really interesting, right? Because it's a, you've got a, it's a fine line between, and, and you touched on it, right? Like if you want to build these economies and, and you want them to grow at scale, you can't have people earning massive amounts of money for, for doing 
uh, for, for paying nothing, right? Like it just, it just doesn't work. And so with us, we, we, we also agree that you can't run a game with a barrier to entry of $700 or $1,300 or whatever it is, um, you know, at the moment, because you're cutting out like two and a half billion gamers out of the three billion that are there, right? It just, it just doesn't make any sense. And so what we've gone with is the ability for you to, as, you, as you're saying, to, to be able to experience the game and not just like a, a tiny little slither of it. We're, we've opened it up in a way where all of the regions are accessible, but you can travel to them freely or you can pay to travel to them. If you pay, then you open up the alluvials to be captured that are in the tier one to tier five range. And so those are the ones that are essentially all pay to win because you paid to uh, pay to play because you paid to, to travel to that region. You probably, uh, not probably, you, you're going to require a tier one shard in order to get uh, a tier one alluvial. And so you've probably spent, you know, you're on the lower end because you're not traveling to, to any crazy regions or anything like that, but, and you're only curing a tier one shard. So you're probably spending 30 bucks to get your first alluvial. And then you can either drop in another $30 or you can literally take that 30. And it's like any investment. The more you invest, if, if there's a, a, a multiplier there, the faster it's going to be for you. If you start with a, a very small base, you're going to have to, you know, grind a lot harder than than the the whale out there. But that's just the way that life works. And uh, and so, in our game, you, you're able to to go and experience it. You're you're able to start, you know, battling, capturing, and selling these these alluvials. And if you in the in the free to play if you want to so that's that's like your barrier to, to entry for the pay to to play uh play to earn and for the free side of it you can travel to any of these regions you can use a tier zero shard which will capture you the tier zero alluvials and uh i there's uh, i think i shared one about a week ago we're keeping them under wrap, like Aaron's trying to stop our, our leaks from happening, but uh, yeah. Von Newman and I aren't really happy about that. <laughs> I saw the water but, bottle uh, today, that was good. Yeah, and so these tier zeros uh, are gonna be available for you to catch. Now there's a leveling system as well. And so this is where the grind comes in. Cause if you just go with, with five tier zero alluvials that are all level zero or level ones, and you start facing off against tier ones, like you pay your, your 20 bucks to travel to, to the region and you come up against a tier one, they're not gonna win the battle, right? You, you have to have the level of those uh, tier zeros, you know, closer to like level 10, level 15, level 20, and then they can start putting up a fight against the tier ones and then you can start capturing those. So. The point there is that it, the barrier should really be around twenty to thirty dollars. The difference between we have control of that, right? And and when I say we have control, I mean literally the players and the the stakers, the the, the token holders have control of that ceiling, right? Because in Axie, you don't know what the price of those axes are going to be. They force you to have an axie to start playing. And maybe they'll change this in the future when they realize that after people continue to print millions and millions of axes, they're going to go down to yeah. a very low floor, floor price. But effectively, if people believe, okay, it's too cheap to start playing, then we can increase the, the price of travel or we can increase the, the price of curing a shard. But it's all controllable and configurable by the council. And so we just think that that's a much better system to have control over that rather than relying on, okay, what's the market gonna do to, to dictate that barrier to entry? Yeah, definitely. And, and just, to, just to reiterate that point of like the paid entry, it goes back to my thing about playing a card game. You, you, mm -hmm. you can't play with nothing. At least this you can play with nothing. But then if you wanna play the game, you gotta buy a deck. And mm -hmm. if you buy the cheapest deck, 
you're going to get your ass kicked until you buy a better deck. And, and that, that's sort of yeah. the principle that I take into the game. But what, the one question I had for you, which I, like, I don't know what's going to happen. So with those tier zero alluvials, you said you've got to have mm-hmm. them leveled up to beat tier ones. When mm-hmm. you sell an alluvial, does it hold its levels? Because to me, in yes. my brain, okay, so I'm thinking free-to-play players can jump in, grind their absolute faces off, level up a heap of these tier zeros, sell them leveled up to people coming in, and that is their Correct. revenue to actually buy entry and shards to be able to capture tier ones. So I feel like it is a... Like, if you're willing to grind your face off, you can actually, as a free-to-play player come in and actually generate revenue, even though it's not directly from free to play, you, you're grinding something, selling it, going to the next yep. stage, you grind a bunch of level ones, you, you keep doing the same thing and it will take a long time, but it mm-hmm. is actually possible to continue to progress without any money mm-hmm. invested. 100%. And the, the reason that we allow that is that there's going to be a mixture of people that uh, are whales out there and have a bunch of, you know, like, I'm not saying that you're a whale or whatever, but you've invested 20K and, or, or whatever you've, you've put in. That's a considerable amount compared to, you know, some of these guys that are looking for scholarships and, and stuff. And, you know, I, I get DM'd at least 50 times a day now. Like, I'm not even joking, at least 50 times a day from people saying, sir, can I please have a scholarship? And I'm like, you don't need a scholarship to play our game. Like, yeah. you really want to, like... There might be scholarships, right? And, and don't get me wrong, I, we can't stop that. And that's part of the reason, like, I love that capitalism side of, of things that people are, are, are building these businesses, that they're, they're third party and they're add-ons to, to this play-to-earn economy. I love that. And whether or not they're still available to people who are like, I can do the grinding my face off for, for 20 hours and I'm going to get to the stage where I get 50 bucks and then that 50 I can turn into 100 the next day and then 200 and then 400. You might get the guy who just goes, nah, fuck that. I want to get someone who gives me a 1,000 bucks as a scholarship and I'm already so much further ahead and then I'm going to be generating much more revenue because I'm capturing, you know, tier threes, fours and fives. That might happen, right? But what I don't want to happen is someone who's begging for a scholarship to play our game. Like that is like the, 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 there's an underlying issue there if that's the case, right? Yeah. And so, yes, the, you know, these things might be available if you want to fast track yourself and you don't have the capital, but by no, by no means do you need that, right? You can get in, play the game and remember we're not building this game based on like just the play to earn side of it. We're building it fundamentally. It's about, Hey, I actually want to play this game because it's fun and addicting, right? The, the ancillary benefit to that is that there is play to earn and you will make money off that. But if all of a sudden the market crashes, we're going to have players who are like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. My DeFi tokens have gone to shit but I still love playing Alluvium. I don't stop playing TFT when the market crashes. You know what I mean? Yep. And so that's what we try to, to do differently. Yeah, and that's definitely what like what my sort of direction was because I'm coming into the crypto gaming space as a gamer and an absolute scrub at crypto, but I just wanted to find a game that looked fun. I mean, Alluvium is probably my number one. There's a couple others that I don't mind, but when you look at just pure polish, like... That that's pretty much why I came into Alluvium, and it's got. I'm I'm a big Pokemon nerd. Wait, I'll even show you. Yeah. <laughs> every every Pokemon that come game comes out, I try and get myself a uh, a shiny Nidoking. King. I don't know if the camera's going to adjust. Oh, there you go. that's sick. So yeah, like, nice. like, I'm I'm complete Pokemon degenerate, and I love hunting shinies. <laughs> and that's what. And when I found out that this game has shinies, so you do have like a very oh. low percentage chance to get those shinies, like. That was like that was like my thing because between between Pokemon shiny hunting and then in World of Warcraft, I don't know if you played, but they used to have um, mm-hmm. these spirit beasts for hunters, which were on an eight hour spawn time. I had like seven different yeah. locations. I used to sit there <laughs> for eight hours a day trying to hunt these damn things. And the day I actually caught the 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 one that everyone wanted, which his name was Lock Naha. Like, I haven't played WoW in like five years, but I still remember that. <laughs> Dude, that will never leave me. I was like the best day of my life. So like that's the kind of thing I'm really 
excited about. And I think from like a content creation and streaming point of view, I just feel like that sort of stuff like adds to value of streaming because if you have those oh. low percent chances to, for something to happen, it keeps people hanging around to hopefully see that stuff happen. So like, I just 100%. think that, that whole side of thing um, just sounds really, really enjoyable to me. But um, with that, and just you go, just just quickly, just quickly on those those holographics. The so Von Newman and I, we you're like we're we're the Pokemon avid fans like exactly like you we we had the whole set like all like play every single game that comes out it's pretty it's pretty sad but we're we're just complete fanatics he was like he basically had a conniption he was like dude i like we we have to have hollows and i was like dude you can't do hollows like it's fucking digital like you can't and he was like dude I can do anything. And I was like, <laughs> all right, mate, here we go. Now he reckons he's going to be able to make 40 holographics. Like, what are you going to do? And we started looking online. He's like, I can build a shader. And if you sit, so he laughs. I'm like, what if someone can recreate this and, and, and use it in their game? He started cracking. He's like, dude, you know, I went, he went, in, he goes into his cave and he's currently in his cave right now building the trailer. But he goes into his cave and he's like, I'm going to come out and you're going to see something that is impossible to recreate because I know I've gone so in on this. And he does, like he works like 20 hours a day for like, <laughs> and he goes a little bit cuckoo, but he comes out and he's like, he says three and a half thousand layers. And I'm like, what what does that even mean he's like it's impossible to recreate this and i'm like okay, okay show me what you got he shows me he's done that he, he first of all i'm like can you do an alluvial of course he doesn't he does the mandalorian and he shows me and i'm just like oh my god yeah. you've just created and he, he wouldn't stop right because we grew up on those pokemon shinies he would not stop until it was the exact same. And like there's, you can fake doing a holographic render, but here's a, what we call true holographics. And like, you need to get him on to just explain it because the technicalities of it is absolutely outrageous. But essentially he, he got to the point where he's like, no, nah, I'm recreating it. And now you see those holographics, they're, pretty close to to what you get yeah in, in real life and 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 that's the thing that's the other thing that i noticed because i've been i've been floating around the discord jumping into some voice chats and stuff like that in the discord and the the attention to detail like um like like that sort of stuff but i also know you you were telling a story about the um the rocks and going to air's rock with a scanner to like <sighs> Like, like so, I don't know, some weird shit that I don't even get, but like just to get the, the, the texture of the rocks correct and all that sort of stuff. So like there's a lot of yeah, fine detail. Yeah. He literally, he's like, he's like, we need to, we need to find, <laughs> I, I literally, I, like, I actually, <laughs> believe it or not, I literally said to him, dude, if you bring this up one more time, I'm firing you. I'm literally <laughs> doing it. I'm firing you if you bring it up one more time. And we're like sort of joking, sort of not. And one day, like two weeks later, he kept on trying. He's like, I'll get him at a good time and whatever. Comes back. He's like, all right, man, you know, we've raised the seed money. We've just got to do it. we got to do it. We've got to send Quaid to Air's Rock. And I'm like, mate, we're not doing that. No, <laughs> we don't. I like, get some scans from the internet. And he's like, that's not the same. It's not the same. We need to go to the fucking level of detail that they do in Hollywood movies. The only way is if we go and get a $90,000 drone, we send Quaid to Ayers Rock on these flights and I'm like, accommodation. I'm sitting there, I'm like, you're a madman. Like, you're actually insane. It's rocks. Who's going to notice? And, oh my God, I hear it every single day. He's like, who's going to notice? Oh, look at this comment about the rocks. Look at this comment about the rocks. And it's, it's literally, it's him. It's Von Neumann. His, his attention to detail, he refuses to not be the best at whatever he does. So yep. that's that's where that comes from. Yeah, 100%. And while well, well, giving the props to some of the people on the team, the audio producers, I don't know who they are, but like they need massive props. That Like just the trailer on the website, if you guys haven't seen it, go there, put headphones on and listen to it. 
like I don't know. There's something about just the the audio that they've put into that trailer that just it it just blew my mind as well. I just just like so those just, guys need a pat on the back. Yeah, the the environment guys and the audio guys, I feel uh, underappreciate. They're, they're not, but it might seem that way because it's very easy for someone to post up an update of an alluvial and grab my attention. I'm like, oh my god, that is the coolest thing ever. If I see a plant or a rock or you know sound or whatever, to me it's just not as as uh, exciting as seeing like a brand new character and whatever. So, but you you're right. And the crazy thing about that trailer is that we had twenty percent of the sound team that we do now for this next trailer. So if you like the first yeah, one, sick. this this second one is going to blow you away. Beautiful. All right, we'll, we'll get onto a different topic. The uh, the one thing I'm wondering. So it's an it's an open world exploration type thing. And there's two questions I got about yeah. the open world because we haven't really seen any gameplay of the open world. We we've seen little clippets of combat. How is the open world going? Firstly, just the quick one because this is a simple yes or no. Will it? Will any plans to make it MMO? Um, so you can see other players in the world. Or will it be at launch or? No, so definitely, definitely not at launch. So that's the expansion that I'm pushing for. I've played every single MMO that that there ever was, basically World of Warcraft. Uh, I played Guild Wars. I played EverQuest. Back, EverQuest is going back. But uh, yeah, I, I played a lot of them. And for me, I don't know. Maybe it's the... <laughs> Maybe it's the the crazy person in me, but uh, I just want to get a clan together and like this massive group of people that are like the strongest in the game and have the most like weapons, alluvials and whatever, and just go start rampaging into other people's towns or areas or whatever and just pillaging their alluvials off them and and having that type of open world where you can have conversations with people i think it just makes it so much more immersive and and community building is is much easier whereas in the game right now it's it's going to be a, a that's one of the things where i'm kind of a little bit like oh is that and and like pokemon's like this you're not running around with with other pokemon trainers in, in pokemon and so I'm a little bit, not so much worried, but I, I just think that maybe people will be like, hmm, I wish there was a little bit more of a, you know, MMO element to the overworld. And so it's definitely going to be the first expansion that I'm pitching for. Can't guarantee that I'll, I'll get it, although I'm somewhat convincing. So hopefully I will. But, uh, but yeah, it's on the cards. And, and is there any guilds or co-op or anything like that? Like just in like a, like you know you can join a guild and then maybe guild quests or something like that anything like that in the game at launch? Not at launch, not yep. at launch. But again, absolutely the the expansions that we're planning, we we definitely want to allow that. Yeah, yeah. And and when you talk about just the open world single player, I don't know if you pay much attention to mobile, but like Genshin Impact is like like I haven't well, heard of that one. Okay, it's like it's like it's sort of trending bigger than world of warcraft and all that sort of stuff at the moment wow. um it's a mobile cross pc game but like it's blowing up and it's just it's um open world exploration but action rpg um but no mm -hmm. mmo type style and it's doing incredibly well so i don't think that'll be like a massive issue in the initial parts but i'd definitely love to see um the mmo side of things but with the exploration i'm picturing in my head like camera zoomed out world of warcraft type style correct yeah. Is that sort of what top, it's hundred percent. Yeah. So it's it's like third person, top down, and you you know, you've you, so someone else asked me one this this question on a stream and it's that these finer details is, are still being worked out. But essentially you're equipped, you very quickly we want you to be able to mine the resources to be able to build your own jetpack and uh, mag boots. And so they're, they're designed to get you into the harder to reach uh, regions and, and crevices and places where you might happen to stumble upon a tier five or, or whatever. And so it's critical that you have enough viewing area so you can, you know, first of all, see encounters because they come up as like little blips in, in, in the, um, on, on the screen. And so if you're, if you're going past and you miss one or whatever, if, it, if it's too 
you know, like first person, you, you're just going to miss too much of that. When you say, so, when you say blip on the screen, are you talking kind of like in the trailer? How is that little bubble that grows out? Is, yeah. Is that, so is that it, the sort of interaction that happens? You don't actually see yes. the move you're walking around. You see this blip and then you get a random interaction. It's essentially, yeah, it's essentially like a portal. Yeah. And, uh, it, there's a lot of lore elements that are attached to that. So I won't go too yeah. deep into that because you, you're literally meant to figure out all of this as you go along. That's part of the exploration. Yep. But yeah, it's, it's basic, basically a portal into another, call it realm or, or world or universe. And that's where you're going to be battling this alluvial or multiple alluvials, yep. depending on the, the case. And once you have seeing these guys you go into battle it's the same mechanics as the pvp it's a it's an auto battler and if you defeat them then you have the ability if you have you know if you're going up against a group of uh, three of them you have the ability to capture all three alluvials it obviously gets a little bit harder as you you know you catch one they start getting a little bit you know they're, they're getting their wits about them again and and so it's going to be harder to catch the next one but you can catch the next one and then if you're really lucky then you can capture all three and then it, it sends you back if they flee it sends you back yeah. right so you might capture one three or, or whatever yeah beautiful and the other thing is is there and like with your daily routine like is there a, like energy type system um that's going to govern your daily gameplay and stuff like that uh not there's there's a I'm fairly certain, I'm, and I'm not 100% on this, I, I would have to get clarification from Aaron, and I can send him a message, just, he should get back to me pretty quick. But I believe there's a time frame for you to be able to enter and capture all of the alluvials in a region. So it's not like we're cap. like if you want to play 24 hours a day, like we don't recommend it, but you can. Yep. But your time inside the the region I think is capped, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. But you, can, you um, but obviously you said you can either go there for free where you can't capture them or you can travel there with money where you can capture them. You could just pay that fee again and go again. Oh yeah. yeah. You pay yeah. The, the idea is we're trying to stop botting. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I'm not sure if we put a, a time limit on there, but yeah, you can, I mean, a, if a bot wants to continue to pay, the idea is it's essentially that, that travel fee is like your deck of cards. So yeah. you buy, you, you, you purchase the travel fee, it, it sends you in there, and then you have, think of it like a, a deck, and you might have like 50 alluvials that, that are in this deck, and you go around and you say, okay, I want to get 10 of them, or I've already got copies of, of 40 of the, you know, yeah. you might have a squeeze and a rampart and go, I'm, I'm leaving them. Probably won't because they're tier fives, yeah. but... Uh, <laughs> got no shards, but, damn it. Yeah, well, that's... That's the, the cool thing. I can't wait until you see streamers like yourselves who have like been waiting, not to say that I, I want you misfortune want me to fail. Thanks, for you. Man. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but, you know, I want it to be like, all right, guys, I've gone in. I've only got 10 shards. Let's see how my mission goes today. You go into one of the, the, the crazy hard regions and then – you there might be like 40 encounters there you've you've gone on to your ninth and then you hit this last one and there it is there's there's a ram fire and you miss him and you're like on stream and you're see and it's holographic right so you're seeing yeah. that and you're like i just don't have another shard like why would i come into this area and not be stacked with shards because I, like i'm an, i'm an idiot what like i'm now i'm gonna miss this thing yeah. and you literally on stream are like leave encounter because you've run out of, and it's just like crushing like yeah. you're literally leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially on the day you should have gone on the pokemon first you idiot <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly definitely um and the last the last couple things i want to talk about uh sort of tie into each other um first you put out a really interesting tweet um talking about esports and prize money mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. obviously it's tied into the way obviously i feel like crypto just allows you to do these type of things because you can set aside funds for prize pools and stuff like that um mm -hmm. so I think your tweet was that uh, Alluvium was going to have the biggest prize pool ever in a uh, 
in an esports competition. Can you can you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So and look, you can uh, take all of my tweets with a grain of salt. There's <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some the there's some yeah there's some pretty crazy ones out there. But no, this this is one where I'm dead serious about and. It comes down to exactly what you're saying. You know, we, we have portioned off 1 million ILV, which, you know, the, the current valuation of, of that is, I don't know, some, somewhere around 450 million. Yeah. And, uh, and so we have this ability to, to offer ridiculous, almost meme-like sort of uh, prize money amounts because, you know, the as you'd know the the top level twitch streamers they know the games that that offer that sort of prize money and if all of a sudden this new player comes out and its first year is offering you know 25 million in prize money for its first tournament or it's not going to be the first because we want to iron out all the kinks and all that yeah. kind of stuff but you know our within our first 12 months if we're offering something like 25 30 million dollars in prize money Think about the eyeballs that that's going to put on our game. Just simply from a media standpoint going like, okay, who the fuck is the Luvian? Like, what is that? Like, yeah, no one's heard of it. Kind of like Booger in uh, Fortnite when he won. I think it was like $3 million and like it was media mm-hmm. everywhere. Everyone's like going ballistic about a 16-year-old kid. How's the 16? Yeah. 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 And and so I want to tap into that. And and obviously, you know, we've – there's there's – tons and tons and tons of uh, of different stuff that we can do for that in-game yield but it's all about incentivizing people to play and that that we're talking about is is true play to earn not so much pay to earn you know you go that that's kind of what the the, the axie is you know you're paying for an axie to try and earn and battle and and, and get more and so but the in-game yield that you can earn from the battles in in axie that's not right. That's just simply playing yep. and doesn't theoretically, it doesn't cost you anything in our game. You can play these tournaments. You could, you could win and you're not paying to enter or, or anything like that. It's literally just, we put on ridiculous amounts of prize money. And if you're good enough and if you play the game enough, then you can win it. That's and, it. and just like, just the thought that popped into my head then is like, you guys could do fun things with that, like have different rules on certain tournaments, have like, you know, low prize money tournaments, but just say I have one where like only tier zeros are allowed. Mm-hmm. And that, that would be like an open up to everyone to try and, you know, you know what I mean? Even the free to play guys yep. who haven't grinded too far, like you can do fun yep. little stuff like that with like minimal prize money, but at least incentivize. So then it's like, if you are good, you're good and you can then win some prizes and stuff like that. Just excuse me for a second. I'm just going to write that down. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> tier, <laughs> tier zero tournaments. That's a fucking brilliant idea. I love that. 100%. But like, and, and that's, how, that's how easy it is, right? Like you think about it. And now can you do that if you have no money put aside? No, of course you can't. You're reliant on you know, big revenues in the game and, and whatever else like that. We do, as you touched on in, in the beginning, is we, we have this ability to portion off this in-game yield and do whatever the council sees fit with it. And uh, and yeah, a tier zero tournament, like that's an awesome idea. Like that, think about how I'll many see, people have, have access. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, it, it'd be like, and like that's that's the kind of thing where like that's real fun community stuff because then people all over mm-hmm. the community from the the mega whales to the guys who have nothing but have been playing the game just through the enjoyment. Like then it's mm-hmm. like, no, 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 this is my chance to show you that I can kick your ass. Like yep. that's that's a cool thing that you can, and yeah, that's the you're just open to ideas with that, and especially with a player governed system that sort of stuff is more likely to get through than in a traditional game where the developers are making the money and they want to incentivize whales and that's the only thing they want to incentivize. So yep, like, th- that's 100%. where you get the options open up to that sort of stuff. And uh, on that whole esports thing, this was one that I heard you talking about on Discord the other day, the mm-hmm. land sales. Can we talk about the land sales and some of the functionality behind the land? Yeah, of course, for sure. So... It, it um, like there's there's a caveat to this. It's it's not uh, it's not it hasn't gone through 
governance yet. It's currently being voted on right now, and I think it will pass, but um, it, it may not. And and so subject you know, to these, change. This, disclaimer. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Disclaimer. Subject to change. But essentially, we wanted to, not even that we wanted to, we knew we needed to. We, we were getting so many hundreds of requests every day to, to have, you know, where's our land, when land sale. And so we got to thinking and we didn't want to launch land without a use case. And, and we could have, and, and again, it goes back to your, your previous statement of just look after the devs, sell a whole bunch of land plots, promise a whole bunch of shit and people are going to FOMO in, right? There's 70,000 people in the Alluvium Discord. They're just going to FOMO in. We're not that, right? We just can't be that and we never will be. And so we got to thinking, how do we make land functional and also really addictive and, and fun to play? And so um, Aaron and Johnny got together. Johnny's our, our uh, CTO. He basically came up with this city builder game where there's, I think there's 26 different uh, types of, of buildings and, and plants and, and resource factories that you can build. And they all churn out these different types of resources that are applicable in the main game. And so none of the configurables have been set yet. So like the, the percentages and whatever, and we'll just use one really easy example to, to get the point across. But essentially, the people, uh, to, to cure a shard, you require resources, which is why there's a cost in the main game to cure that shard, because you're essentially cleaning it to allow it to, to be able to capture the alluvials. Yeah. Now, basically making your Pokeball workable. <laughs> yep, yeah. exactly that, right? Now, let's assume that 90% of the resources required to clean that shard come from the main game, right? So you're just buying it as a function, essentially buying it from the vault, let's, yep. let's call it. Now, the other 10% is made up of the resources that come from the land game. And so if I have land and I start mining all of these different resources from, uh, from, from within that game, I can then sell that or I can hold on to it. And depending on what the, the majority of, of uh, landowners decide to do, that will increase or decrease the price of curing a shard. If all yep. of a sudden the demand is, is, if all of a sudden the supply is overextended and you've got all the landowners, which I think at the, in the very beginning, they're going to be looking to cash in on, on their resources yeah. and the price of shards is going to go down, which is actually going to be a really good thing for players who, who are first starting off. But then you might get into a situation where we're six months, nine months down the track and people are like, okay, shards are way, way too, too cheap. I'm going to hold onto my resources and I'm not going to sell it to the game. I'm going to hoard it and yeah. hoard it and hoard it and hoard it. Then you're going to see the price of shards slowly creep up until it gets to a point where some landowner is like, okay, now like I'm getting such a premium for my resources, I'm, I, I have to sell them now. I can't do this. Even though you might be in some sort of a coop with other land barons that are out there who are like, we're never <laughs> selling. First Let's, jump and, makes and, the profit, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, hold the line. We're not going to do it, you know. Screw those alluvium, like mainstream players. Like we're the landowners. We're the reason that this game runs. We sort of thought, what happens when we <laughs> throw a, a, a little bit of uncertainty into the mix and you get a whole bunch of game theory that starts coming out. Then people are like, fuck, do I need to buy like, you know, I, I, do I even need land or like, can I rely on those people to sell it to the thing, to, to, the, to the main game? What if they don't? And it starts getting really, really interesting. And do I the, buy a shitload off the landowners at the start and then hold it myself and then I can sell it later on? Yeah, it, all of that, right? Like literally all of that. And so it just, you know, it's like we could have, as I said, we could have just sold the land and I guarantee we would have sold millions of dollars of land and gone, yay, your land does nothing for you. Wait until alluvium launches. 
this is a way for us to a bridge that mobile gap which i know you'll be a big fan of because yep. this mini game is being built in uh, unity and so it's it's mobile friendly we're also looking to have it out a little bit before the main game and so it'll give people something to do yeah but the main thing is we're selling land that's functional and and yes we might do the land sale a couple of months before the game's actually live but you'll know why am i buying this land yeah and and so what you wanted to touch on as well is, and this is a this is another idea from Johnny, and I, I couldn't believe, I, like I love selling shit, can't tell. But the, 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 this one that you're about to talk about, which is the tier fives, I was I had my headphones in listening to Discord, moving beds in my house to change room for the kids, and I just I, I just stopped, I just walked away. I'm like, this is ridiculous, like it was <laughs> stupid. But yeah, keep going, keep going. So yeah, so. Um, Aaron hits me up and he goes, Hey, Johnny's just had this brilliant idea of creating like super rare land plots. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, what, what if we made the tier fives hold, uh, give, give those tier fives. We, we make seven of them, seven only. And seven is, is based on how many regions we're going to have in the main game. But there are, there, there will, I did, and I'm going to put this IIP through very soon. But there'll be seven land plots where you can actually build an arena on. And so, as you know, these tournaments generate a lot of streaming revenue, right? Especially when you're talking about putting on prize money of like 20, 25 million. You're talking about getting millions of players and and tens of millions of people tuning into these streams. And so not only do the, the people who own this land get a percentage of revenues from the streaming. They actually also have the ability, very similar to like the the concept in Decentraland, where you can buy a a, a large plot and uh, and then go and market whatever you want to do to all the Decentraland players. Think of it like having a spot at the Super Bowl, right? Where you've got these boxes and the people that own the boxes, you would, you know, you, you'd go to large DeFi protocols like your, I don't know, maybe you go to like your chain links, your synthetics, and you say to, hey, Kane from synthetics, you, I've got this piece of land. I want to sell you this box, which is yours for a year. And any tournaments that are hosted in my, on, on, on my, uh, in my arena, you can give access to say, and again, these, these numbers are arbitrary right now, but let's call it 16 people out in, in, can get this ultimate experience and they'll have a whole bunch more perks than just your standard viewer who just goes into the stadium and doesn't, and doesn't have access to these boxes. But you'll be able to get like really intricate views and, uh, and, and like access to things that the the normal people just don't have access to and you'll also be able to market and and have like light boxes and stuff in the actual arena where you'll see chain link sushi swap synthetics and as the landowner it's literally like think of it as real life right like he's out there brokering these deals on a yearly basis saying like all right i'm signing you up to this box for a year i'm signing you up for six months give you a little bit of a discount we don't care whatever the, whatever that person wants to do. It's their plot of land, but obviously the 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 viewing and 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 having like that that special little area for for people to to watch these esports tournaments is cool. But the big big kicker is the percentage of revenues that they get from from hosting that tournament on their land. Yeah, definitely. And w- with that sort of thing, like, and to people who aren't in crypto, like me like probably two months ago like i would just like i mean it doesn't like but like there's a lot of money in crypto um and people willing to part with a lot of money and when you look at it like even just esports at the moment are just on the grow and there's a lot of money involved so if you do get that ecosystem and obviously it's all tied into the game having success coin going Mm -hmm. up value goes up there's always unknowns about everything but if it if all the cards fall where hopefully they're meant to um, it just opens up this big possibility. Now, also with the land, that ties into 
the cost of what these tier fives are going to go for, thinking there's only seven of them, you <laughs> potentially have a big income stream if thing if the game goes well, um, mm-hmm. and you have control over basically big events. Um, so that's going to come with a premium price tag. I don't know how much we're thinking. Like I- I'm thinking like a <laughs> hundred ETH type thing, which is, you know, 300,000. I'm thinking up to a million, like roughly, I don't even know. Cause obviously it'll be auctioned off. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- the other thing that that ties into is people are like, Oh, well that's just like unfair. But the whole system of the game is that is then becomes the revenue of the game, which then goes back into that vault which then buys more coins, which then gets distributed to the players who are the stakeholders and it all comes back around. So it's sort of one of those things where it's like, yes, it's going to be premium, but hey, not not everyone, like not the 70,000 people in Discord can all have a tier seven. It, it, it destroys the value mm-hmm. of it. But from having mega whales buy in and get them at an, a premium price, it actually flows through everyone. 100%. Yeah. You know, look... You can buy a ticket to the Super Bowl and it's going to cost you a hell of a lot. To buy the stadium that hosts the Super Bowl, it's, you know, yeah. there's not many people on earth that, that can part with, with uh, funds like that. And so in this case, the, the, the positive thing is exactly what you just explained. If these plots, you know, and, and again, I, we can't say what the price is going to be because you get a whole bunch of whales in there that, that understand the economics of, of uh an esports streaming and being able to get those rights to those revenues they're gonna go for for a lot of money but it doesn't matter right because as you're saying it's all going into the same vault and same thing with multiple titles that we release it every single thing that we create within alluvium's ecosystem is all held by one single governance token and that's ilv there's only 10 million of them out there but all of these revenues, whether it be for a stadium, whether it be for the land sale, you know, whatever it is, it's going to go back to the stakeholders, to the, to the community. And so you never need to worry. Like, it's always a, a conversation that I have with people like, oh, but what if I can't afford land? It's like, if you can't afford land, and when we do the buyback on ILV and you get those distributions, you're not going to be crying to me. You're going to be coming back being like, oh, I'm glad they went for 10 times more than I thought because look at how much money we have now. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not like it's going to this centralized entity that you don't have access to and you're just like, well, this is bullshit. It's unfair. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, and maybe that's one little closing. I've held you for way too long already, but um, just you, you mentioned multiple titles and stuff like that. Just just a bit of a vision across the whole Alluvium IP and like the direction going forward. Um, what you plan? Yeah. Are. So yeah. So obviously we've got staking out now, um, which which anyone can join into. We've got the land sale that'll be happening. Then we've got Alluvium Zero, which will be launching hopefully you know uh, before the end of the year. The main game, same thing, but again, you know, if it if it moves into early next year, there's there's a potential there. Yep. It's going to be for a reason. It's going to be because we're literally trying to release something that is completely polished and, and really really awesome to play. But uh, then after that, it's, it'll be closely followed by us starting to work on mobile, and then. Things like set two of, of the alluvials will, will launch. And so that's that's another thing that we haven't touched on. These alluvials are all attached to a bonding curve. And so once that bonding, that timed bonding curve is up, you no longer be able to get those, those alluvials. And there's a little bit of talk about maybe we leave a, a tiny percentage of them so you can like come across them and just be like, holy crap. Like two, I years found down, one. Two, two years down the track, you catch a set, you see a set one and it's like that ma- mega hype moment. Like It's like, oh my dear Lord. Yeah. But again, super, super, super rare to, to be able to do that. And so, you know, we're, we're keeping things interesting. We, we always want to be giving new content, new experience. And that's why we built a team of, of, so many people and, and why we're going to expand that even further because this is an ecosystem that we're going to be part of for the next five to ten years and 
the last thing that I'll say, and, and this is something that we literally decided as a management team, and no one knows this, this is a leak to you, and this is going to be coming Perfect. out literally in the next like couple of days. But the management t- team has decided to tack on an additional two-year lock to their tokens as well. Ooh. And that's for us to say, we're not fucking around here. We are not trying to get in and, and get rich quick. Like we're here for the long haul. And we think by the, the upper management, we don't want to, we don't want to like ruffle any feathers with our, our team members who have come on oh, or whatever. Yeah, they've got agreements. They're, they're workers there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the upper management that, that started this first game and, and that are holding the largest amount of tokens, we believe that we owe the community something to, to, to show that we are literally in this for the long term and we're not going anywhere. Beautiful. That's good. But uh, I, like I said, I've held you a long time. Any other fin- final words that you want to touch on or anything you wanted to mention before we finish up? No, I think, I think we've covered a lot. I, yeah, I can, I can definitely talk a lot. But um, <laughs> if you... Yeah, if you want to do this again, I'm more than happy to. I've seen your, you know, your other two channels. I love talking to you. It it would be awesome to to do it again in, you know, three, four months or whatever. Definitely with some updates and stuff like that. It'd be perfect. All right. Well, Sweet. Um, beautiful. Thanks for coming on, dude. Really appreciate it. No worries. Looking forward to seeing it. Cheers.